The sound of the sabuna, or the Greek bagpipe. The strains of this instrument would have been very familiar to Theodore and Mabel as they journeyed from island to island. At the time of their travels, the sabuna was still one of the most popular folk instruments for the islanders. Its prominence was probably linked to some degree with the goats and sheep the islanders were raising. Every part of the animal was used. The milk was used to produce the delicious mazithra cheese enjoyed by the bents, while the meat formed the key element of many local dishes that we still enjoy today. Even the entrails were used for the ubiquitous dish kokoretsi and the Easter soup margaritza. The woolen hide of course found many uses. Maybe somebody hundreds or even thousands of years ago scratched their heads searching for other uses for the goat's inedible skin. With a gurgling, a squealing and a wailing, the sabuna was born. Theodore was never too adoring of the melancholy sound of the instrument. That wretched Grecian substitute for the bagpipe, he wrote on an affi. And in Carpathos he describes it as a species of bagpipe being a goat skin with the hairs left on which palpitates like a living body when filled with air. These instruments are romantic enough when played by the shepherds on the hillside or in the village square as accompaniment to the dance, but they are intolerable in the tiny cottages where women tread their flannel. Despite his dislike for the sabuna, one does wonder whether he really had a sneaking admiration for it. While in Carpathos, he acquired his own sabuna and brought it back to England, where, after his death, it eventually found its way to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. Did Theodore ever learn to play this wretched Grecian substitute for a bagpipe? We'll never know, but it will be nice to think he at least tried. During the 20th century, the Sabuna's popularity faded, and it's only in recent years that a small number of traditional musicians has embraced the instrument and is bringing about its revival. One of these musicians is Janis Pantasis, who crafts his own instruments and demonstrates them in his artisan workshop in Santorini. Yanis is an outstandingly versatile musician who fell in love with the Sabuna on first hearing before he even knew what it looked like. Ever since, he has devoted his life's work to the plaintive sounding Greek bagpipe and the other instruments in his collection, such as the lyra, the panpipes and the flute, as well as traditional percussion instruments. Pop in and see him if you're in Santorini. You will undoubtedly end up gigging with him as he demonstrates and enthusiastically talks about the history and mythology attached to each instrument. There's a final twist to this tale of Theodora and the Sabuna. On the 11th of January 1884, he and Mabel came ashore in the south of Santorini, having travelled by sailboat from the neighbouring island of Anafi. They landed near the small church of Ayas Nicolaos. A little white thing under a red rock, wrote Mabel. Taking a rough track, after some difficulties, they finally reached the hilltop village of Akrotiri just before dusk. Eating only what they'd carried from the Nafi, they slept the night in the tower of the Venetian castle. That very tower, known as La Ponta, was the first workshop of Yanis Pantasis, where he constructed and played the instruments seemingly both loved and abhorred by Theodore. Yanis had never heard of the Bents, but he believes Theodore's accounts of the Sabuna are some of the earliest records we have in modern times of the playing of the instrument. La Ponta has cast a powerful spell over the course of the past 130 years, bringing into its orbit two key figures, generations apart, one who experienced and documented the popularity of the Sabuna in its heyday, the other spearheading the vanguard of the renaissance of the instrument today. One hopes Theodore would have approved. <laughs>